Jay Caldwell's collection of baseball memorabilia shows the game at its most colorful. But his most recent undertaking, to illuminate the stars of baseball's Negro Leagues, was inspired by a distinct lack of it. I think the Negro Leagues and the Negro League players are very underappreciated, and the only way you can really view them is in very few black and white photographs. So I had the idea of let's do a whole series of paintings to bring these people to life so that they will relate more to a younger generation. And the hope is by getting them to relate to a younger generation, we'll be able to teach history at the same time. In February 2020, Caldwell's collection of more than 200 original portrait studies debuted at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Part art show, part history lesson. The exhibit will soon be touring the country, a chance to experience the richness of Negro Leagues history as never before. I think they're going to be in awe of the paintings, but I also hope that they will read the little backstories that we put up next to the painting. And from that, to learn a little bit about the player, but also learn a little bit about the history of the period, uh, really from about 1850 through uh, 1960. There's this long history of professional baseball players that most people don't know about. Legends like Saul White, who authored a history of colored baseball in 1907 and was an early and vocal advocate for the sport's integration. Or Billy Williams, who in 1904 was offered a contract by the New York Giants if he would pose as Native American. He turned it down, saying, I'm a Negro. I'm proud of my race. They were extremely good. There's no doubt that many would have played in Major League Baseball. They traveled in all parts of the country. They traveled overseas. They were goodwill tours to you know, Japan and the Philippines and China. They played in Puerto Rico and Cuba and the Dominican Republic and Mexico and Venezuela. And they were appreciated internationally. They had experience of all kinds of cultures. They could contrast how they were treated in Mexico or Japan versus the United States. That gave them a perspective that most people didn't have. A perspective players shared on their return, both in their daily lives and on the diamond, eventually culminating in Jackie Robinson Hello? breaking baseball's color Hello? barrier in 1947. And so I want to convey this history and the civil rights struggles that they went through. As we talk today Hello? about various issues of race relations and so forth, is there more to do? Yes. But we've come a long ways, and some of those early pioneers were actually the Negro League players. The paintings and associated licensed collectibles can serve as new platforms for their stories, barnstorming the country as players themselves once did, propelling baseball forward by the power of its past. There's a need to pass on this history, and this is one of the vehicles to do it. All right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. And another edition of Legend Sports and Amplify. And I am really happy today to have on historian, collector, driving force behind Greg Kreindler and his work uh, to bring the Negro Leagues to life, Jay Caldwell. How you doing, Jay? I'm doing fine. How are you? I am doing good. I'm doing good. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today to uh, to do this. Um, this is something that I've been trying for the last, uh, you know, I guess uh, it's been um, six months now, maybe seven months, to try to get the stories out there of people who have had a hand in, in the, the stories, to give context, to give... Um, uh, the backstory to the recent announcements from Major League Baseball, and and you you know you had um, quite a hand in in uh, all of this, and it's, I think it's important that people um, people understand that because it's it's something that um, that the uh, 
uh, the stories are important. So again, mm -hmm. I, I thank you for taking the time. So um, I, I ran that video, and I got to get my video. It's a little jacked up on the screen right now, but I've got to get. Uh, you know, um, I, I was thinking it was important for people to see. You know, a little bit of, of your the mindset of why that was done, um, the, the bringing to, to color from the black and white, and we'll talk about that. But um, you've had a hand in this and, and talking about Negro League Baseball for a number of years now. So uh, I do like origin stories. It's something that Professor Brunson, you know, kind of gave that label to people's beginnings and how they got the passion. You're a baseball collector. Tell us a little bit about how your background, how you got into it, and, and, and why it became important to you to tell these stories about the Negro Leagues. All right. Well, uh, thank you. The um, uh, I primarily grew up in a small village about 25 miles north of uh, Cooperstown and have been, like many people, interested in baseball since a very early age. Um, the idea of uh, supporting the Negro Leagues uh, started in the 90s um, when I actually uh, hired an artist named Monty Sheldon who paints uh, baseballs, does an excellent job. He's kind of more of the modern day George Sosnack. Um, but as I was, uh, getting near retirement, um, I was thinking about some kind of post-retirement uh, activity and uh, was thinking back to uh, uh, when my children were growing up, uh, they would always make fun of me for watching black and white movies and black and white TV shows, um, which I enjoyed during my youth. And that got me to thinking that the Negro Leagues were one aspect of baseball that you only see in black and white. And so I did have the idea from those conversations with my children to see if we could bring uh, the Negro Leagues to life and put them in color, which would attract a more younger or a younger audience. And Monty Sheldon, the painter of those uh, baseballs, introduced me to Greg Kreindler at uh, the National Sports Collection uh, Collectors Convention, I believe in 19 or in 2017. And he and I got to talking and he agreed that uh, he'd love to paint the Negro League players who he had not painted before. Uh, in most cases, I believe he had done a couple. Um, and so we agreed on a program that would lead us to uh, an exhibit that we could display at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. I had previously done a show of Monty's uh, art balls at the Negro League Baseball Museum and I think it was 2013 in conjunction with the MLB All-Star Game that was in Kansas City that year. So I got on the phone to uh, Bob Kendrick, the president of the museum, and explained my idea to him, uh, knowing that the centennial was coming up and we would need time, or Greg would need time, to make all these paintings. And so we agreed to do a major exhibit, both of uh, paintings, uh, primarily uh, um, Greg's, but there were some other artists involved as well, and uh, exhibits of uh, artifacts that I had in my collection, and that led to uh, the big exhibit that opened on the centennial of the founding of the Negro Leagues on February 13th, uh, 2020. Awesome, and I had Greg on here, I guess it was back in April, right after uh, Jackie Robinson Day, I think it was. And we talked through, and he, he brought that up about, you know, your your role in all that, and I don't think a lot of people knew that, uh, you know, who was, you know, was kind of the driving force that helped, you know, commission some of these, and he walked through that process, and, and, and I, 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 everybody, I think, understands why you picked uh, Greg, because his work is, uh, it's just incredible how he can, it's photographic, I mean, his, his work is really amazing, uh, but the timing... Um, getting all that done, uh, can you can you walk us through a little bit about when when did that start? How long did Greg have and 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 to get to where you finally were able to display them at the museum? Okay, well my my memory may be slightly fuzzy on this, but <laughs> as I recall, we started in um, late 2016, um, and he had a schedule um, of how many he had to do a month, basically, if I remember correctly, we had to average about eight a month. 
in order to get everything done by February of 2020. So, you know, it was important that we start, that we kind of get a general agreement as to not only between Greg and myself as to um, how this process was going to work, but also with the Negro League Baseball Museum uh, in order to get, you know, not only a contract to uh, uh, be able to use the various uh, uniforms that they have under their control, but also uh, make sure that they agreed to the concept of doing the exhibit. And it really came off beautifully. Um, I think Craig finished the last of the paintings in January of, uh, of uh, 2020, um, just a, you know, maybe two weeks before the exhibit went live. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. I, I, I look at his work and, and he calls them color studies, but even those are just in, incredible. I mean, when he when he spends the time to do the full paintings, they're they're mind boggling. But even the color studies are, are absolutely incredible. Uh, and so then along comes the pandemic, uh, which shut a lot of this stuff down, which, again, like I mentioned, this is kind of the reason why I'm trying to do this to in my way, give a little bit of, of exposure to people uh, that maybe have not heard these stories, but also, mm -hmm. like, like I said, to try to give the credit to the people who have been at this for a long, long time and, and uh, uh, have had a hand in keeping a lot of these stories alive. And, and, and like I said, your, your story uh, goes beyond, um, you know, that research your attempt to t tell us, you know, why, the, why you felt it was important to colorize these black and white. Well, yeah, just based on uh, input from my children who really relate to, you know, color better than the black and white. And, um, you know, Greg is not only a fantastic artist, he was a great guy to work with, and I still work with him on various projects. Um, but uh, uh, that is his day job. He does paint for a living. Um, I had to uh, fund the paintings and um, part of what I wanted to do in, um, as I looked over the landscape as a collector is with the Negro Leagues, there were very few Negro Leagues products available. You could certainly buy jerseys, replica jerseys. You could buy um, some t-shirts, uh, uh, ball caps. Um, but that was about it in terms of contemporary products back in, uh, uh, you know, 2016, 2017. Um, at that time, based on some uh, research I've done uh, with others, uh, there were about um, 46 bobbleheads that existed at that point in time of Negro League players. And of those, um, uh, I think it was uh, 20 were just three players, uh, Satchel Page, uh, Josh Gibson, and Buck O'Neill. And so my thought was to fund it, I would try to make a Negro Leagues collection of various products and started down that path. And, you know, to date, we've uh, made 142 different bobbleheads, wow. uh, six different card sets. Um, we had t-shirts, we had coffee mugs, posters, um, refrigerator magnets, and all of that really was meant to provide the funding to be able to afford the uh, paintings that uh, Greg uh, did to highlight the uh, individual players of the Negro Leagues. Interesting. I, and, and your um, website is out there. Uh, currently, right at Negro League uh, Baseball, Negro Leagues Plural, History dot com. So, are are any of those things still available? Can people still get if they check them out? Well, at my website, um, many of them are no longer available, um, and for a multiple of reasons, some have sold. Uh, many have sold out. All the card sets are sold out. Um, many of the bobbleheads have sold out. Um, I've discontinued the magnets due to uh, price increases that just didn't make it affordable uh, for uh, retail anymore. So um, it is contracting, um, but we hope to you know, have uh, some of the bobbleheads are still uh, in production and will be coming out uh, either this fall or early next year. And we're trying to continue with uh, some of those series. Awesome. Do you, do you have a hand with any of those, with any of them that are given away at major league games or anything like that? 
Um, I've only had um, I've had two stadium giveaways, both minor league teams, um, uh, for bobbleheads, uh, the Lake Erie Crushers and the Florence Kentucky uh, Yalls. Yalls. Um, I've had two card sets given away as stadium giveaways, um, uh, both of them in uh, Wisconsin. Um, so you know, fairly minor involvement there. Um, it really depends on. Uh, you know, being connect, uh, contacted by the players and, uh, or not the players, by the teams and kind of moving forward. And to that extent, uh, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum has been great and just sending referrals to me as they get them. Awesome. So you're in Washington State. I uh, appreciate you're up there a little, bit, a little early. Well, it's 9 o'clock, I guess. But uh, yeah, so you're in Washington State, but that's not where you began, right? What, what, tell us a little bit about your, because you've been in Iowa. You've been in the two, I guess, will be considered the uh, the heartbeat of baseball, right? Iowa and Cooperstown? Well, <laughs> I, was, I was born in Iowa. That is correct. Uh, but moved, uh, my family moved out of there when I was young. Uh, I think I was uh, uh, eight years old. Um, but we, uh, uh, we moved uh, a couple moves and then hit uh, uh, the Cooperstown area by the time I was in fifth grade and uh, lived there through um, my college years. And once graduated from uh, college, I uh, uh, took a job in the Seattle area and have been here uh, ever since. And so, is that how you, how your passion for baseball and collecting began? Because you, you, you have a lot more items and memorabilia than just uh, with the Negro Leagues. Well, um, I do, and um, I started collecting at a fairly uh, early age, and continued that. That was just, you know, my passion. I would have loved to have been a professional baseball player, but didn't have the ability, <laughs> and um, uh, just. Uh, uh, continued collecting and um, again just kind of uh, got inspired uh, by the Negro Leagues I actually attended Satchel Page's induction ceremony wow. um, in awesome. 1971 um, and um, wow. one way or another just again as I was thinking about black and white and the, you know what could I do I I knew I couldn't compete with any of the great authors and historians in terms of you know, telling stories. I mean, you know, people, whether it's, you know, Lester, uh, Larry Lester or Phil Dixon or, you know, so many others do such mm -hmm. a great job of that. Mm -hmm. um, or the Sabre Bio Project, which mm -hmm. brings in, you know, individuals from all over. Um, but I thought where there was a hole, a uh, couple holes was um, in uh, trying to bring these uh, uh, photos of these players uh, to life through color. And then uh, looking at whether I could make uh, some products to go along with that. So that was the niche I tried to uh, fill. Mm -hmm. And but on top of that, though, as we were talking about before we got started, uh, there's some other items that are in the baseball museum, the Eagle Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City now that uh, you kind of had a hand in as well. Can you tell us about about those? Well, yes, as part of the uh, uh, centennial exhibit there, in addition to all the paintings, um, I contributed, I think it was about a hundred artifacts from the Negro Leagues. And um, the museum really enjoyed wow. them and wanted to keep them. And um, we struck a deal where they were able to uh, keep them and make them part of their permanent collection. Wow. And I guess, you know, uh, a couple of those that were, um, to me, uh, were most important were uh, Rue Foster's financial ledger which uh, ran, if I don't have it in front of me, but if I remember correctly, it was from 1920 to 1926. Wow. And in it, he, uh, his secretary, it's not in his handwriting, but his secretary recorded uh, the dates of games uh, by team, uh, what the uh, gate receipt was. And then you can see at the bottom kind of of each page where they've summed the receipts and Rue Foster got his oh, wow. uh, bookings commission usually 5% on a couple teams, 10%. Um, but, you know, from a historical standpoint, it was great to show um, how the teams um, perform financially. Uh, again, I don't have it in front of me, but mm -hmm. if I remember right, um, you know, the Monarchs were almost every season were the top grocer uh, in terms of receipts. 
And some of the early teams uh, that dropped out, like the Dayton uh, Marcos, uh, were making 10% of the gate of the Monarchs. So there was obviously a you know great economic uh, uh, discrepancy, yeah. um, but that also helped you know prove at least for league games and a few uh, non-league games where the games were played and matched up with newspaper reports or maybe even helped some researchers uh, find games they weren't aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, another item uh, that yeah, they were very glad to get was a. Uh, 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 signed baseball by uh, Josh Gibson. Um, another one that I think had great historical significance was um, an original uh, copy of um, the Negro Motors uh, Green Book, right. which uh, was produced uh, for a number of years and would have a state-by-state state listing of uh, within each state and by city uh, where uh, African-American motorists, uh, travelers, could get uh, uh, hotel rooms where they could find restaurants that would serve them, mm-hmm. gas stations that would serve them, hairdressers, barbershops, et cetera. Um, I believe the Negro League uh, Baseball Museum had a replica or a photocopy of the one that Buck O'Neill used, but they had never seen an original oh, one before. Wow. And so now they have that. Wow. I mean, when you think of these things, right, and I mentioned this to you before we got started, uh, that's the context that people today, I think, need to hear and understand. Because, you know, first off, as we're, as we've been talking about, these guys were not playing in the Negro Leagues and in black baseball for all those years, decades, mm-hmm. a, cent- a century almost, uh, before Jackie Robinson, because they weren't good enough to play. It was simply mm-hmm. the uh, racist... Jim Crow, whatever you want to describe it as, time period that we were going through as a country, and and and, and people need to hear that it, it's not just about. I mean, you know, when when Major League Baseball made that announcement, and in Baseball Reference as well, uh, a few months later, many people that I talk to and, and I'm, I'm in contact with on other places, other forums, a lot of them are statistical based and so forth. You know, their immediate pushback was. Oh, come on. I mean, they were playing half these games against, uh, you know, the local firehouse team. And how could you count all these statistics? Mm-hmm. And and they, they weren't getting, and a lot of it I knew where it was coming from, where that viewpoint was coming from. But, you know, the fact that they were doing the barnstorming, that was an economic driver. That's how they made money. They made more money on probably barnstorming than they did, uh, you know, in league games. But, but you know, or it was only a 70 games, you know, 60, 70 game schedule. No, these guys were playing probably 150 to 200 games a year when you count it in, mm-hmm. sometimes two and three in a day. That was a, that was a lot of work. And, and now put on top of that the layer of the time period it, it you cannot put it into box scores and standings on 162 games it's not that simple it, it, there's a lot more context to it and and i know as we talked about that's an important thing that you you've actually tried to uh, highlight as well right well it, it has been in very um, several different aspects you've touched on a number of things uh barnstorming was clearly necessary for the teams to survive um at a time when there was no TV and radio was still in its infancy and not everybody had a radio, um, uh, barnstorming brought entertainment to rural communities that otherwise were starved of uh, any form of entertainment. And it would prove to be a great success. The um, other aspect that you've uh, touched on was uh, the struggles the players had as individuals, as well as just a, um, the general African American community, of dealing with the Jim Crow laws, mm-hmm. and so a lot of our um, the baseball cards that we did, um, the story on the back wasn't so much about statistics and how many wins or how many home runs. It was about uh, some of the civil rights issues they they faced. Um, starting with Octavius Caddo in the uh, 1870s, -hmm. who uh, was killed um, uh, for uh, uh, voting rights uh, um, as he tried to exercise his uh, right to vote for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, And that kind of leads through many others. Um, uh, One, I mean, more modern is uh, Elston Howard, who everybody I think knows is a 
the great catcher uh, for the Yankees, who uh, began his professional career uh, with the Monarchs. Um, but after winning the, uh, I think it was the, it was either the 62 or 63 MVP award in, uh, for the Yankees, uh, he moved and was subject to redlining where he was mm -hmm. not able to, or was uh, the city re uh, uh, resisted his ability to buy a house Interesting. Um, because of uh, the rule. So it, oh, wow. it, you know, it goes uh, for a long period of time. And it was part of what they had to deal with in their uh, daily life. So we, we did try to uh, emphasize that. I think in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, statistics, uh, seamheads.com uh, did a great job of just mm -hmm. compiling these statistics over a long period of time. And uh, they had the contribution of many excellent historians who supply data as, the, as they came across it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that <clears throat> I think now is holding back recognition of the Negro Leagues players is that up until, I'm going to say the 70s or 80s, they um, had to exaggerate their performance in many ways ah. um, in order to get some recognition, just to kind of show how great they were. Uh -huh. And so there were things like, you know, Satchel Paige winning uh, 2,000 uh, <laughs> games, Josh Gibson uh, hitting 800 to, I don't know, 960 home runs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, Dick Redding is uh, reported to have uh, thrown uh, seven no-hitters in a season. Um, Bill Holland through, uh, I forget, I think it's 30 in his career, 30 no-hitters in his career. And those kind of exaggerations were meant to kind of put um, them on the map. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's a disservice because people will look at that uh, yes. and they see how great, say, Nolan Ryan was, who threw uh, uh, five no hitter, five, seven no hitters mm -hmm. in his career, and compare that to Bill Holland and say, well, boy, this isn't possible. Mm -hmm. Or you've got, you know, Cy Young, who won 511 games. And you try to contrast that with uh, Satchel Page of 2000. And I think that now um, is in the way of the recognition of the players because it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable for a reason. It wasn't those 2000 wins were not major league equivalent wins. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, Satchel Page deservedly is uh, one of the, you know, always considered one of the greatest pitchers ever. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not 2,000 wins worth. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the, the thing that I've always, uh, what I've been saying is, uh, I, to me, the most telling is once Jackie Robinson came into the league in 47, between mm -hmm. then and 1960 or so, virtually every most valuable player in the National League was a former Negro League player. There were countless of them that were all-stars, one Cy Youngs, uh, and 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 they didn't just spring out of the earth. They they mm -hmm. had learned the game and learned how to play it in the Negro Leagues because it was the only opportunity that they had at the time. Uh, and so that right there should tell you that the talent was there. It didn't just appear in 1947 to 1960. It was there for decades prior, and and uh, that to me is telling. The other thing you just touched on, I, I've tried to point out as well. You're you know what you said about no television, no radio. Uh, the Negro Leagues never have gotten, I don't think, the credit, the recognition in spreading the brand of baseball all around the continent. Not not just the country, but into Canada and the Caribbean and even South America and, and, and how that grew the game uh, through a lot of their efforts and and it's something that people should be aware of. I've, I've had on Professor uh, Adrian Burgos uh, to talk about Latin baseball, Rob, Professor Ruck to talk about the impact, but that was the gateway and, and why the Dominican Republic is such a powerhouse in baseball today. A lot of that goes back to the, the roots of the Negro League and it's important that people know that and, and they get some of that recognition. Well, I agree. And uh, they were able to spread the word um, of baseball or the gospel of baseball throughout uh, the Caribbean in particular, uh, but also um, uh, Asia uh, with Japan yeah. and China and the Philippines and Hawaii. Um, and that was actually another aspect of the paintings that uh, Greg and I worked on together 
we wanted to show not only the players, <clears throat> but we wanted to show the teams uh, the uni through the uniforms that they played for, because those were not as well recognized as Major League Baseball. And beyond that, we also tried to incorporate uh, images of all these various leagues. So we have some players, you know, in Cuban uniforms, Dominican uniforms, Mexican uniforms, Panamanian uniforms. Awesome. We have them uh, touring uh, Japan, uh, the um, uh, the Royal Giants. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And that wasn't that, uh, an important aspect of what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And and it's all part of the context and the and the the backstory and the history and and people. Um, I think need to wrap their heads around a lot of it. I, I, like I said, I think people people today, especially like if, even if you're a halfway baseball fan, first thing that you, you, you tr usually do is you check to see what the score was from the night before, and you want to see how your favorite players did, where you are in the standings. That wasn't always, you know, uh, available or readily available. Um, plus, you know, you pointed this out too. The telling of the stories, the mythologizing of uh, of some of the efforts that they made. Uh, think about what they were dealing with. The keys to the kingdom, right? I mean, the commissioner of the sport, uh, who that's the reason why his name is no longer on the MVP award, but Kennesaw Mountain Landis, um, Spink, J.G. Uh, Spink with the sporting news, you know, they, he's no longer associated with, with that as as well because they they... Uh, I don't want to say actively suppressed, but maybe they did. They certainly never told the stories, um, you know, the way they could have been told in the sporting news. And, and that it was the Bible of the sports. So if you're not seeing it there, how do you get yourself noticed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the other thing that's interesting, too, um, is I always hear a lot of this, like, well, it was the unwritten rule, the, the gentleman's agreement. No, in, in, in the late 1800s, I believe it was 1896, Separate but equal actually was a law <laughs> that was right. with that was Plus with it. yes that was withheld upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States. It it's, wasn't some gentleman's agreement. It, it was it was literally a, a law, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and and I I'm not sure how people. Uh, I mean, certainly today uh, you look at that and you go, how is that possible? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it, it's it, it it did happen. Um, Baseball is, you know, often criticized for um, the obvious racism that was involved, but baseball was not unique in that. It was the policy of the country. Mm -hmm. And um, where I think baseball probably doesn't get as much uh, consideration as it should is with Jackie Robinson integrating, uh, that came before um, the U.S. Army integrated. It came before Brown v. Uh, Board of Education, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the landmark uh, civil rights uh, uh, cases. Uh, when baseball integrated, if I remember correctly, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was still a, uh, a junior in college. Um, so, you know, it, you know, from, you know, the 19th century to, you know, integration, uh, baseball really reflected the mood of the country mm -hmm. uh, or the, prevail the prevailing mood of the country. Um, it broke out of that uh, before most institutions did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing about baseball, like you just pointed out, it being the mood of the country, it was the sport. Uh, everybody had a baseball team. It didn't matter. Yeah. It was your local uh, firehouse to your local company playing. I mean, everybody, baseball was in everything. So when baseball did something or didn't do something, uh, it had a lot of sway. It, it really well, it really did. You do. You, and you have to look at it, again, in context, which is so much different than today where, mm -hmm. you know, the number one sport is, you know, the National Football League. Back in uh, the 19th century and through the um, – you know, through World War II, really, um, I think the top three sports were baseball, uh, college football, and boxing. Boxing, yeah. And um, you really, I mean, obviously, uh, baseball and college football have survived very well, but boxing has uh, uh, waned quite a bit in terms of popularity. Um, and so uh, uh, you always have to try to put things back in context and try to see how they came forward. Um, another thing that you mentioned about, you know, publicity, um, 
you know, white newspapers or the major newspapers didn't really cover the Negro Leagues except, you know, in some ex exceptional um, situations. And I want to get into a story about that in a moment. But, um, you know, the black newspapers, which is a, was a thriving industry, did. Mm -hmm. The problem with it was that um, most black newspapers were weekly. There were a couple that were, um, mm -hmm. you know, semi-weekly and maybe one or two that would be uh, uh, daily in a uh, major city like uh, New York City, but they were not, weekly was by far and away the most common. Mm -hmm. They could not afford to send reporters on the road in most instances. So they would, you know, try to compile the prior week scores uh, based on local reports. And that became the basis of a lot of the, uh, the records that we have today. And what made it so difficult, you know, and talk, I had Scott Simkis on here, Gary Gillette, and talking about that, the difficulty in trying to do some of this research, because a lot of that up until just recently was not digitized. You had to go and dig in the microfiche, and you had to go and do that research, and that was a, a lot of hard work. And like you just said, because of that weekly aspect in most cases, um, are you double counting something? Do you have it right? Do they include mm -hmm. them all? I mean, I, I can't even imagine how difficult, and that's going to be ongoing, I'm sure, uh, you know, for quite some time. Well, it, it is. And um, I mean, at all kinds of levels, you, you know, the statistics uh, seamheads.com uh, has today are different than um, a year ago, two years ago, when we made our baseball card set, the Negro Leagues Legends. Uh, if you try to you know look ah. at the statistic you're going to see that they're they're different mm -hmm. um hopefully not because we made an error but because more statistics have come to light and have mm -hmm. been compiled another example of that is i believe you've had peter gorton on mm -hmm. the show for the donaldson network mm -hmm. and he'll periodically announce you know we found another game where donaldson pitched and he got five strikeouts mm -hmm. or, you know hit a home run or whatever it might be mm -hmm. um and it, it is ongoing and, you know, things uh, uh, pop up, all these great historians, uh, none of them have asthma, I don't think, is it digging through all these dusty files, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, coming up with these statistics, they do a great job. You know, uh, you pointed this out earlier, but um, the Negro Leagues and what I've tried to, you know, highlight as well is that it, it the odds are at some point in your area in your town there was a negro league tour a player uh, uh something happened you know from coast to coast and from canada down to uh cuba and 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 if you looked around odds are you're going to find it and, and you i think when we were talking earlier you pointed out that some of these you know collections and things that you've come across were through auctions and i'm sure people had things in their attic for half a century or more and that's mm -hmm. how they wound up in places but you know uh scott simkis just told me the other day that they just found several dozen more box scores from uh, a small town in western Pennsylvania that had Homestead Grays games and mm -hmm. they found it because they they did some outreach they said hey you know we're looking for um, if anybody's got anything or any information or can point us in the right direction in these particular areas we're looking for this and sure enough mm -hmm. they found some so it, it's there people can find uh, can find it and you never know what you're gonna find don't throw anything away. Anybody, yeah. <laughs> if you buy, anybody, if you find something, the value of it, uh, you may not know at the time, but uh, it, it might have some significance. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. out there if people just take the time to to uh, to do it. Uh, so you have besides um, what 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 else have you collected besides the Negro Leagues? You have other other items that you've been uh, collecting over the years as well, right? Well, um, I have, um, you know, I, I guess I, I had a scattergun approach, honestly. Um, looking back, I wish I had picked a theme and kind of stuck with it. But I had, um, you know, a number of card sets. I uh, tried to collect as much as I could from Walter Johnson, who um, I felt was the greatest and still feel was the greatest MLB picture of all times. Um, I had, uh, well, I talked about the art balls from Monty Sheldon. Uh, mm -hmm. Art and baseball was always a, a huge uh, focus of mine, and I uh, lost track of the number of those I have, but <laughs> somewhere probably close to 200. Wow. Um, and um, 
just other things that would come up. I, uh, I was born in 1953. And so I tried to collect everything I could from 1953. So cool. it, it just a lot of odds and ends. What's your, what's your most prized possession that, that, that you personally think is, is uh, your favorite? Well, boy, I guess, um, actually, it, it's a poster. Um, it's called 100 Years of Spring Training, uh, based in Florida. And um, I, uh, I spent years running around the country to various uh, autograph shows, collecting uh, signatures of baseball players. Ah. Uh, on them. And ended up uh, with, I think it's 234. Five signatures oh, wow. on that poster. Um, some of them, uh, I mean, you know, they're big names. There's Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Mickey Mantle. Wow. Um, modern ones like uh, Ichiro and Ken Griffey Jr. Cool. Um, but there's a lot of obscure players too. Uh, say, you know, Babe Dahlgren. Um, what well, couple names are escaping me now? Um, but. Um, uh, Fascinating. Oh, Bib Falk. That was the one I was looking for. Uh, you say, who, well, who's Bib Falk? Uh -huh. uh, well, he's the guy who replaced Shoeless Joe Jackson in the outfield for the Chicago White Sox when he was banned. Wow. Um, so there's, uh, you know, that was uh, that was fun. That was just a lot of fun. I bet. Uh, a lot of air miles trying to get all those. Because, like I said, I live up in the, you know, in Washington State, and we don't have a... Uh, the strong uh, baseball history that um, you know the Northeast and the uh, Midwest, upper Midwest has, but um, it was a lot of fun doing it. Awesome! Now, it, very very cool that you were at Satchel Page's induction in Cooperstown. What what was that like? You know, back then uh, the induction ceremonies were much smaller than they are now. They're now held at the Clark Athletic Facility, which is a, a beautiful facility, um, you know, that Cooperstown has that uh, through the generosity of the, um, uh, of, I'm going to call it the Forbes family, um, uh, who donated the money is much bigger than the uh, uh, pop, you know, what, what a populate uh, that a, a village of Cooperstown, right. which has a pop year on population like 2000 would ever have. Mm -hmm. But Page's ceremony was on the steps of the library, which if um, if you're facing the Hall of Fame from Main Street, which runs right in front of it, is on the left-hand side. And um, I don't know how many people there were there, maybe 2,500, 3,000. You know, this week when uh, Derek Jeter goes in, I wouldn't be surprised if they have 50 or 60,000 mm -hmm. um, if it weren't for COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's just changed a lot. Um, and one of the things that we actually worked on that um, I'm proud of that we're going to, we're, we're, we're uh, struggling to get released because of um, supply bottlenecks in China where the bobbleheads are made. But we signed a licensing agreement with uh, the Page family. We already have, you know, which we've had for a while, um, the Negro League Baseball Museum and the Baseball Hall of Fame where we're producing a series of bobbleheads of Satchel Page in various uh, points in his career. But what's unique about them is they have uh, audio chips in them oh, where wow. Sage is talking in his voice about various aspects of his career. Oh, and wow. two of those um, bobbleheads um, are of him standing on top of the Baseball Hall of Fame holding his plaque uh, in one of them, he's in a 1942 Monarchs uniform. In the other one, he has the suit and tie that he wore to the induction ceremony. And they're experts of uh, his speech as he relates various things about his career. Um, oh, there's 11 bobbleheads in that series. Nine of them have uh, chips of uh, Satchel Page talking. One of, it has, one of them has Cool Papa Bell relating the story of uh, Page's uh, tryout with the C Cleveland Indians and um, how he, he basically won the attention and uh, won the, uh, a place on the roster with his performance in the tryout. And the final one is uh, Judy Johnson talking about the great Negro League pitchers and naming them and talking about, you know, very wow. briefly about each of them, including Satchel Page. 
That is so cool. I can hardly, I can hardly wait. So what, what do you think? What's the timing? You said there's a bottleneck. What, what do you, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's unfortunately a huge bottleneck. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be probably January before we actually, they actually hit the shores. I'd love it to be earlier. Yeah. Um, we were actually supposed to re- re- release the first one in July of this year. Um, and it uh, didn't happen, but, right. um, you know, it's just, I mean, you read the newspaper and, mm-hmm. you know, you see about, you know, chip shortages, which drove a lot of this. You see mm-hmm. about, um, production bottlenecks and shipping containers, you know, mm-hmm. can't get from China, the U S ports and so forth. Mm-hmm. And we're impacted by that. We're obviously a very minor part of that through the mm-hmm. whole, you know, production and economic, yeah. uh, recovery area but it's real <laughs> absolutely right now there was you wanted to touch on something uh regarding um the process because i know when i talked when i talked to greg that was something that when artwork is done as a as a one of it's it's a it's it's a simple straightforward this is your as an artist your rendition so to speak but when you start getting into other things it's a little more complicated right well it is um You know, when you're dealing with current major league players, with maybe one or two exceptions who've opted out, you deal with two entities to get licenses. You deal with the with Major League Baseball to get the license to the uniforms. And generally, you deal with the Major League Baseball Players Association to get uh, licenses for the images and uh, 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 likeness of the players Um, with the Negro Leagues. the Negro League Baseball Museum has rights to uh, most of the um, uniforms that uh, we're concerned with. But then you have to hunt down uh, the players, uh, remaining families or estates, and um, try to get licensing agreements with them. And that's um, compounded. There is no national registry. If you wanted to find, uh, just picking a name out of the hat, wanted to find the um, uh, uh, a state of uh, Spotswood Poles. Um, good luck. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to track that down. And then, um, you know, the the rights to the images are governed by state law, not federal law. Mm-hmm. And so generally it's dependent upon the state in which they passed away in. And so not only are there various time limits, um, but there are also other conditions in many states about who actually owns the rights Mm -hmm. or whether the rights have expired. And so you have to deal with all that. And then another unfortunate part of this, like so many aspects of collecting in any area is uh, there's fraud. Mm -hmm. Um, I did sign a licensing agreement with uh, the granddaughter of Cool Papa Bell. And at a point uh, somewhat Ah. after I signed that, um, somebody contacted me who said his name was, um, uh, James Thomas Bell and he was cool Papa's grandson. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that caused me concern because, well, now do I have somebody else claiming rights? And so I called the granddaughter and asked her, you know, do you have a brother you didn't tell me about? She said, no, I'm, you know, I was adopted. <laughs> um, uh, I was, you know, I was the only descendant. Oh man. <laughs> So, you know, you just have to, it's, it's, it's complicated. That's all I can say. And I think that's one of the major reasons why there really weren't very many products. I bet it's got to be a a nightmare. You know, one thing I I discovered, and and like I said, I I thought I was a baseball fan. Turns out I only knew half the story until I met some of these players back in 1992. Um, Turns out I only knew a third of the story because I, the Caribbean angle uh, as part of all that as well. But I never knew, and I've collected baseball cards over the years. Not a, not a big collector, but never knew that there was these. There were card artists that were doing their own cards, and and until the Josh Gibson MVP card art campaign, where there were seventy, I think seventy nine uh, artists who each did a rendition for part of that to raise some awareness and some some uh, funding for the Gibson Foundation. Um, never knew that that was a thing. <laughs> I, I can only imagine, you know, once in that, I mean, I'm not sure what's going on in there with, you know, can, can these guys, is it, can, can you do it? I guess you could do it. I don't know. Can you make more than one? What you're saying has got to be a nightmare. 
Well, yeah, and I mean, it, it's not up to me to enforce you know, right. the contracts. It's up to the individual players of the mm -hmm. Negro League Baseball Museum where they you know own rights. Um, I think a lot of people, um, you know, the one-off cards, there's absolutely no problem with. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to be an attorney, which I'm not, to see, uh, you know, what the legitimacy of is of certain limited edition uh, products where the author... Um, Mm -hmm. enhances the color a little bit or signs mm -hmm. it, you know, one of two, 20 or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not an attorney and can't say whether those are truly mm -hmm. legal or not. <laughs> Others that are made, I don't believe are legal um, because they're re they make them in quantity. Mm -hmm. um, no attempt to make it original art, mm -hmm. but that's not up to me to enforce. Right. It's up to uh, the families. And oftentimes um, it's just not worth the bother. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the cost of se sending a cease and desist order is mm -hmm. greater than what they probably are losing in royalty, so they don't bother. Right. So, uh, what is next for you? Are you so you've got this this satchel page with the bobbleheads uh, coming on? What else you got going on? Well, we have a few uh, bobbleheads uh, coming out. Um, we hope next spring, uh, which this uh, uh, may actually be my last Negro Leagues uh, effort will be a, um, in terms of products, we actually have a, hopefully have a beer series coming out, which will feature many of the Negro League players uh, on the cans. Uh, we've gotten agreements to do that. Cool. Um, but the other things I'm really working on is trying to, you know, get a traveling exhibit going along mm -hmm. with the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So that exhibit that got, you know, shortcut due to COVID in uh, 2020 will tour the country and people will be able to see it uh, without uh, you know having to travel too far from home as it makes its way around the country. And mm -hmm. we hope to have that going uh, by next year. Um, other than that, um, you know, it, based on requests, you know, we've done, we've supported various other efforts in uh, 20, I think it was 2020, uh, Black History Month, February, we supported um, an effort um, from the uh, Pittsburgh City Council where they displayed a lot of images of Greg's uh, for Black History Month of, uh, you know, players from the um, Pittsburgh Crawfords and the Homestead Grays. We supported an effort for the Hank Aaron uh, invita Invitational Baseball Tournament, uh, where we provided card sets for, um, I, I don't know, I think it was like 300 players that were invited to it to get, you know, professional instruction. Um, uh, you know, as, I con as I'm contacted by minor league or uh, baseball teams for stadium giveaways, we try to support that. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll continue to try to support those uh, areas. But um, it's kind of, it is kind of winding down. Um, I've retired a few years ago. My wife retired at the end of last month. And the mess you probably see behind me is us packing up, getting ready to move. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> So um, it's, 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 for me, it's coming to an end, and hopefully somebody will pe pick up the cudgel and continue on. Um, it's uh, but for me, probably next year is going to be uh, the last of it. Well, I, I, hats off to you, man, because I'll tell you what, the, the, uh, the, the whole effort um, in, in the last several years has been, uh, to me, just phenomenal. I mean, I, I, can't even, I, I, I can't even comprehend the work that you guys did to make that all happen with Greg's artwork and, and that mm -hmm. display. I, I hope that that gets on the road soon um, to be able to have that tour in the country. That'd be great. One other thing I wanted to mention too is uh, you, the videographer that did the video that we watched when we first got started is Matt Lieb, L-E-I-B. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So so he's got a website out there, MatthewLieb.com, I believe, right? That, uh, That's correct. If, if, how, he, if people wanted to check out, there's other videos he did as well, right? That's correct. And they're on uh, Venmo. I think that's how you pronounce it, Venmo.com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's a wonderful videographer. He, uh, I, I ran into uh, I Matt um, after giving a uh, talk to a, um, the Seattle Sabre uh, um, uh, group uh, mm -hmm. several years ago. And Matt approached me afterwards and you know, he has a, he was working for both uh, the Mariners and uh, University of Washington at the time cool. and thought he'd like to make some of the videos. So we collaborated on that first one that I believe that you showed. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a number of others that have been uh, at least uh, <clears throat> twice now 
more have players shown at major league uh, or not major league minor league baseball games where the one you showed is kind of pregame mm -hmm. and then there's a series of uh uh 10 player videos that are cool. shown in between innings and kind of a recap at the end of the game of all the uh, uh negro league players who have been inducted into the hall of fame awesome very so, very cool um, I I'd love to talk yeah. to him down the road as well. Very, very cool yeah, work. Uh, he, he does a great job. He did. I, it's phenomenal. Um, Jay, thank you so much. This, this was great. I know I appreciate you taking the time. You're in the middle of moving and, and taking the time to, to, to talk uh, well, today. Um, and hats off to you, man. Uh, if you're going to be uh, one more year doing this, uh, all these years have been well spent and appreciated. I, I just just so you know that I'm sure there's been a lot of people that appreciated your work. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, the, again, the, the the star really is Greg Kreindler, and uh, I was just behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I was more like the director, with him being the, uh, <laughs> the leading actor. But um, <laughs> thank you for your kind words, and thank you for having me on the show, and. Um, Hopefully we'll have a chance to do it again sometime. That'd be great. Thank you, Jay. You have a great day. Thank you. All you right, too. Bye-bye.